1 Peter chapter 1, and our text for this evening is verses 3, 4, and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Our living hope uh, by the, as a result of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter, he's writing, of course, to uh, the elect of God, the church of God that's scattered, um, the church that is by this time scattered throughout uh, the entirety of Asia Minor. They're in the midst of great distress. They don't know literally what a day will bring forth. Uh, they're under a severe persecution. Martyrdom is taking place. Um, people are being thrown out of their homes, losing their possessions, family members, uh, and so on. So it is in the midst of this distress that Peter, the apostle, uh, he writes this letter um, to these people, to these dear Christians, uh, in the midst of this distress and trial, in order to inspire uh, their faith and, of course, to build them up in their faith and hope. So the theme is that of consolation and comfort. There's no pity parties, but there is consolation and comfort. And he begins rightly so, of course, with this, um, well, this opening doxology, you know, praise to God, uh, which, of course, is, um, that's the right place to start. We always begin with God and we finish with God. Verse 10, uh, the Old Testament prophecies um, have been fulfilled, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently into who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. That's been fulfilled, it's come to them, and it's come to us too, of course. That which the Old Testament prophets said would happen has happened. The revelation of Christ, that great epiphany, verse 7, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing, the great epiphany, at the end of the age of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, um, as a result of all this, the elect of God in every day and generation, Peter's day, these people distressed whom he is writing to, will obtain, he says, the end of their faith. Verse 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation, the deliverance, the final full deliverance of their souls. So there's hope. Yeah, there's persecution. The world is fiercely coming against you, but there's hope. The end is in sight. They're just a bunch of people, you know, kind of like ourselves here tonight, in the eyes of the world, insignificant. I mean, the church has always been insignificant in the eyes of the world, isn't it? You know? In the eyes of a wretched world, you know, we're, as the Apostle puts it, we're, we have become and are still, he says, 1 Corinthians 4.13, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. That, that's, that's how the world sees the church even today, is it not? But the reality is somewhat different. In reality, we are royalty. In reality, we are kings and priests unto our God. We are aristocracy. Turn over the page to chapter 2 and verse 9, will you? But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Hold your head up, brothers and sisters. Your royalty in the eyes of the one who matters God. Yeah. You are, Peter is telling these beloved Christians, you are as secure as secure can be. And that ought to be, that ought to fill you with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Because that's what is ours in reality, however the world treats us. So blessed be God indeed. Praise be to his holy name for what he has done to us, made us, given to us and is going to do for us and give us in the days yet to come. So, um, you know, um, he 
gives this eulogy, you know, he speaks well in glowing terms. Ephesians 1, Paul, uh, verse 3, in the same way, you know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. It's all ours. Praise be to God. Christ is ours. The Father is ours. The Holy Spirit is ours. God triune is ours. We are God's and God's is ours and everything else is ours too because of that. Life is ours. Death is ours. Everything is ours. We're untouchable. So, beginning at verse 3, the new birth. God in his mercy who has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice will you in the verses the apostolic emphasis on Lord and Christ. Acts 2 verse 36 that all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus that is, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. That was an apostolic emphasis. Jesus is Lord and Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah promised in the Old Testament ages. He's the Messiah who saves and he's the Lord who's exalted on high and who rules and reigns throughout the worlds and throughout the ages. Jesus Christ is Lord. And so these Christians and we today who face persecution, perhaps not as fiercely yet, but as they face the rigorous slander and the persecution of the world, Peter seeks to encourage them in Christ. And of course, as our own society in this, our day and generation darkens, we need to think in terms of what Peter lays before us here, what a big, what a great merciful God we have. And who is on our side. And that what he has done is decisive. Is revolutionary. And is irreversible. Because the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. They are irrevocable. If you have been reborn of the spirit of God. Yeah? And we get this beloved. We are not the cause of it. 1 John chapter 12. Those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. It was God's sovereign, gracious operations upon our, our own souls by which we were born again. God is the cause of it. It was what he done. He made us alive. He made us new creatures in his son, Jesus Christ. The life of God has been implanted in our souls. That's something that all the religion in the world can't do for a man, for a woman. Filling our hearts with new powers, new motives, new thoughts, new desires. Now we desire what we once hated. And now we hate what we once desired. Our desires for God and our hatred for sin, and especially our own. So behold, says the Apostle Paul, new creatures. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Begun to come. So the source, you see, is, um, is, is the mercy of God seeing us in our pitiful, natural-born state, in our natural condition, carnality, enmity in our hearts against God, God in Christ stooped down and broke into our lives, broke into our hearts with his grace and caused us to be reborn. And so now our hope rests upon what God has done, his promise, the promise of God, the power of God. Remember, you remember Peter's denial of the Lord, I don't know the man, with cursing and swearing. And of course, afterwards, um, for three days, he, he, I, I, I dread to think how the man must have felt for those three days. 
absolute despair and, and, and desolation. Surely it was only by the grace of God that he didn't follow Judas and top himself. Utter and absolute despair. He had denied his saviour. He, 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 had, he had denied the teacher. He had denied his, his master. And here he is, a broken man. But what was it that brought him out of that despair? It was the fact of the resurrection. The fact that Jesus Christ was alive. His, his, his brothers and sisters had seen him. And, and, he, and he was alive. And the message had come to him. Go to Galilee, like, like I told you. And don't forget, don't forget, remember, tell Peter. It was the fact of the resurrection that broke the darkness and filled his soul with light and hope once again. Raised in Christ. Begotten of the, begotten of the Father uh, to this lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Raised, you have been raised in Christ. If you are in Christ tonight, beloved, you died 2,000 years ago with Christ. And you rose with him 2,000 years ago. If you are raised in Christ, then that means that all that is meant by death is behind you. The tyranny, the king of terrors is gone and gone forever. You're not just forgiven. You're not just out of your sin. You're not just out of Satan's domain. That you are. Most definitely. But without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there can be no spiritual life. There can be no hope for this sin-darkened world. There can be no hope for, for anyone in the face of the tyrant of death that reaps its harvest year in, year out, throughout the ages of the world's history. But Jesus Christ, he is it, the resurrection and the life. And we live because he does. John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Believest thou this? Believest thou this? The liberal deniers, of course, of the resurrection which abound uh, within the church in every day and generation, they take a knife, they plunge a knife into the heart of the gospel. This is not fiction. This is reality. This is what God, this is what the Almighty has done. And this is what we possess, a lively hope. And beloved, whatever you are going through, whatever trials, whatever temptations, whatever persecutions you are facing in your life presently, however uh, big or small, say to yourself day after day, over and over and over again, this what kind of spirit is it that lives in you? Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The spirit of the living God indwells you. Remind yourself of it constantly. The spirit that dwells in me is the spirit of God. And in him, through him, I have salvation. Verse 4, a new inheritance. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. The objective hope follows um, the subjective. We have hope. We have a future. It's all ours in Jesus Christ. Exiles um, is what Peter's saying in verse 1. The strangers, the exiles scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, throughout the world, in other words. 
But that's still, of course, the case today, isn't it, with God's believing people the world over. We're scattered through, throughout the world. We're aliens as far as the world is concerned. We don't belong to the world, else it would love us. We're strangers, we're pilgrims, we're just passing through this veil of tears. But you see, the guarantees that God has built into the gospel, isn't it staggering, beloved? The guarantees, the assurances, the promises. What more could God possibly say to us? Is it not a wonder to us, to ourselves, that we have so little poise, that we have so little peace? Man, we've got the lawyer's letter. Huh? We've got an inheritance laid up for us in heaven. Don't you think it's time that we started living in the wealth of that inheritance? Hmm? I mean, one of a relative of yours, you know, was, um, you know, was, 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 um, was, was passing away and, and I told you, you know, that you, he was going to leave you five million pounds, you know. And of course, the time comes when that relative passes away and, and you know this money's coming to you. Would you be waiting for your, your style of living to change? Wouldn't you, be, wouldn't you be starting to spend it almost immediately? You wouldn't be waiting. Well, you've got this inheritance. It's guaranteed you. You've got the lawyer's letter. It's laid up for you. Start using it. Start living like you've got this inheritance. I mean, ought that not to have the effect of making us a heavenly people? with a quiet assurance and poise, you know, inward serenity, assured, you know, because of our status, because of our royal status. We are, we are kings and queens, if you like. So what are you doing trudging through this world with your head down, looking at your feet? Huh? Afraid to even smile sometimes. This inheritance is imperishable. The moth can't get in and eat it. The thief can't break in and steal it. Rust can't touch it. Nothing can touch it. It's undefiled. It's so pure. It's so lofty that not even the remainder of your sin throughout the remainder of your life can touch it. It's unfading. That means it's everlasting. Yeah. It's fresh. It's sweet. It's clean. In reality, it transcends all human speech. Kept for you, guarded for you, protected, just as you are. We're a protected species. And so too is your inheritance. It's guarded, it's protected for you in heaven. Earthly inheritances, of course, can be lost. You know, a false guardian, a faithless guardian, a weak guardian. You can lose it for all kinds of reasons. But this inheritance you cannot lose. It's guaranteed. And it's not us who keep it. It's God himself who keeps it. So you see what power? You see what power? You see what glory is ours? The many dangers, the trials, the snares, the battles that we, that we face in the world and maybe shall face in time to come. God has pledged himself to us. He has pledged, pledged heaven to us. Heaven is ours. So in faith, you see, we need to grasp the reality of what God says in his word, what God has spoken and what he is speaking even here this night, what he has promised you. And use that to keep you near the throne and to keep you walking with God through it all. It's not just that you can be more than a conqueror. Beloved, you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. And died for you. Thirdly, we have a new power, verse 5 who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We too, you see, are under a protective guard. The term is a military one, uh, kept, you know, guarded, 
um, and the power, the dynamics of God. So in the midst of all the foes that we face, you know, who are intent of robbing us of what God has given to us and even of destroying us if they could, well, the psalmist, he promises, he assures us that our keeper, he never slumbers. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The keeper of Israel, he never, he never slumbers. So neither the devil, nor the world, nor the flesh can remove, can deceive, can entice us away from God. Oh, they may try, but they cannot. Because we are kept by the power of God. Our salvation is irreversible. Oh, you may be assailed, but you will prevail, you will triumph, because God will make sure that you do. By the power, by the dynamis, by the omnipotence of God. What is the power of God? The power of God is that which brought the universe into being, spoke the universe into being in six little days, 24-hour periods, might I add. It's the same power that sustains the universe, the world, the human race, everything, all of God's creation is sustained by his power. It's the same power that keeps you as a child of God day by day. Do you see how Peter, you know, these Christians who are in distress, who are facing this terrible persecution, do you see how he drives home the, their security that is theirs by the power of God? Faced with persecution. John, he says in chapter, chapter 10, I, I, I love these verses, I give them eternal life, he says, and they, they shall never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. How, how much more secure than that can you be as the child of God? I say it again, you're untouchable. I'm told I'm always repeating myself. Salvation is all of God from beginning to end. You're saved by God and you're kept by God. And it's brought to a conclusion by God from start to finish. It's all of God. Because at the end, God will be vindicated and he will, he will be seen to have been the starter and the finisher of it. And there is no one but no one will take glory from God. And so we are insistently called to faith, to a faith that's, which itself is the gift of God. And so therefore a faith that stands its ground in the midst of the trials and temptations, the persecutions, against even the devastating human evidence of death. Yea, though I walk through the shadow of death, says David, I will fear no evil. Why? Because that's all it is to a believer. It's just a shadow. There's nothing there. Nah. Faith, you see, receives stability and power from God. He fills our faith with the power as is sovereignly needed. Faith is kindled, it's preserved, it's empowered by the grace of God. It's the same faith, you see, that kept Daniel in the lion's den in the furnace. How would you say I could never face such as that? You know, what on earth would I do with that if I was faced with, with, with such circumstances? No, no, perhaps maybe at this moment in time you couldn't. The grace doesn't come to you before, it comes when you need it. God will give you what you need, when you need it. <coughs> but without that faith, without that faith, kindled, inspired, preserved, empowered by God himself, in the face of all that we are faced with in the world, beloved, we would be gone. 
but we triumph in the presence and by the power of God because we are a people of God and we are a people with hope. It's hope, you see, hope that keeps us going. Colossians 3 verse 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things which are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The world looks at you today and sees no difference in you from anybody else. But your life is hidden with Christ and God. And the time will come when the world will see it. Yeah? When your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The salvation, Peter says, to be revealed. There was a time when Peter thought he could do all this in his own strength. Do you remember? I won't deny you. Not like these. Huh? He was, um, um, uh, Peter was a, a synergist. He thought that God needed his cooperation. But now he's a monergist. He knows God has to do it all without his cooperation. The man has learned. Now he realizes he is kept by the power of God. Just as you are, beloved. Just as you are. And just as you will be in the days to come. But everything's ready, Peter tells us. Ready for the glorious epiphany. The glorious unveiling when Christ appears in glory. And that, that salvation that's to be revealed. Well, it's been ready. It's been ready for a long time. It's been ready since, since Christ finished his earthly work. Since he, since he uttered from the cross, it is finished. It's been ready. It's there waiting for you. Immense. Hmm? Immense things impending in the mighty power of our God. What a gospel, huh? Oh, if you don't, if you haven't, do. I implore you on behalf of Christ, repent and believe the gospel even tonight. But if you are a child of God, what a gospel. Go on, go up and down the world, whatever you will, and go and proclaim this gospel to, to a lost, to a hopeless, ruined perishing world with no hope in this world or for the world to come go my beloved brothers and sisters and tell them of this lively hope that you've got and that can be theirs if only they will repent and believe the gospel yeah amen We sing our concluding item of praise, which is number Psalm 